Well, come on in, everybody. Let's uh, gather together and we'll get started. And thank you again for your patience in, in starting this Dean's Convocation a, a little late. Um, have you enjoyed Business Week thus far? It's quite an experience. And thanks to all of you who've uh, played such a vital and significant role in the fundraising efforts and the activities that have gone on, whether it be the marathon dance that we had last Friday night or the uh, sale of the t-shirts. I see a lot of them uh, here today, the game day t-shirts, uh, the work uh, that was done on the uh, uh, golf tournament, uh, many, many other activities and compliments to Skylar Jenks and the business council and everybody involved in that. Uh, we've had a wonderful intellectual experience this week as well. We've had uh, four really outstanding, five really outstanding uh, visits uh, this week. I'm sure there are more, but those are the five that I, I know about and have had a chance to participate. On Monday, we had a great visit by Roger Martin, uh, Dean of the Rotman School of Management at the University of Toronto. And uh, Roger's uh, uh, speech uh, on the design of business, where he talked about the power of moving mystery to heuristic and heuristic to algorithms and the importance of reinvesting in the business of understanding mystery, I thought was fantastic uh, and was full of tremendous uh, practical advice. The whole uh, notion of the difference between analytical thinking and intuitive thinking and the integration of those through design thinking uh, is very powerful and we're incorporating some of those ideas in the new design of business course that we are uh, uh, piloting this year under the leadership of Dr. Fossen and, and uh, Troy Oldham. Then uh, on Wednesday, some of you may have had the chance to be involved in the networking dinner that took place over at Hamilton's, uh, where we had Dave, uh, Dave Finnegan, who is the chief, invest, uh, chief information officer, they call him the chief information bear at Build-A-Bear Corporation, uh, come speak to us. Dave is a graduate of Utah State University of this business school and has done phenomenal things. He joined that company in 1998, a year after its founding. He talked about the opening of the seventh store and now Build-A-Bear has over 400 stores in over 30 countries. So it's an extraordinary story and um, really it's, uh, Dave's a great model of what you can do with Utah State University uh, uh, education. He made one comment that I thought was really very powerful. And I'd like it to just share it with those of you who weren't able to be there. He talked about the difference, the magic that occurs when a kid, a young person, participates in the process of building their own teddy bear or play dog or frog, uh, whatever it might be, take, take home the kit and get involved and, and help create this bear and how much they own it and how magical that actually becomes for them. And he drew a distinction between, you know, going down to your local Walmart and, and buying a bear right off the shelf and being involved in building a bear. And as soon as he made that observation, it struck me immediately the parallel that exists between that idea and the idea of owning your own education and building your own education, being responsible for your own education, as opposed to just sourcing your education like you would off the shelf at Walmart, if you will. You know, any school can do that. The University of Phoenix can do that. Uh, but Utah State University creates another possibility for you, and that's a possibility of owning your own education and being a co-creator of that uh, uh, education experience. And it's in that sense that I want to introduce my good friend Henry Eyring uh, to you today. Because Henry is one of the brightest minds that I know. He is uh, an extraordinary talent. Uh, he is driven first and foremost by a deep sense of personal uh, purpose and uh, passion in his life. Uh, he graduated from BYU uh, with an MBA and a JD, and then went to work for a uh, monitor company, the same company that Roger Martin uh, co-led back in, in Boston. In fact, Roger 
very closely uh, associated with Henry during that time, a great mentor to, to Henry. And I had the privilege of working with Roger and Henry as a team on a client that I had up in Canada. You remember the Repap account? Repap. And uh, uh, it was a powerful, powerful day. Very, very uh, impressive work that Henry and, and Roger uh, did together. I think there was a $100 million opportunity that was missed on that particular day. But uh, Henry, since uh, 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 19, mid-1990s, has been back in the state of Utah and now in Idaho. He was the uh, director of the MBA program at BYU for a while. He joined the board of uh, Sky West, of Peterson Capital, worked for Peterson Capital. Um, and uh, in, when was it, Henry, around 2000 that we were invited to do that study for the LDS Church? We had the opportunity to work together to design a leadership development program for the employee leaders of the LDS Church. This is the managing directors, directors, and some managers uh, in the in the professional organization of uh, of the church in Salt Lake City. In that connection, we had the opportunity to do a tremendous number of of uh, interviews with uh, church leaders, uh, both on the ecclesiastical side and on the professional side, learned a lot, designed a program, and uh, we were in the final stages of getting approval to deliver the learning experience when Henry was called uh, to be mission president in the Tokyo North mission of the, of the LDS Church, which he did for three years. In the final year that he was uh, there in Tokyo, uh, he was invited by Kim Clark to join him uh, as uh, a key transformation agent at BYU-Idaho. Kim Clark, as many of you know, was formerly dean of the Harvard Business School and was uh, asked in 2005 to become president of BYU-Idaho. And Henry has been up uh, since he returned from Tokyo in BYU-Idaho in a, in a process of transformation that I think is truly breathtaking uh, at that institution. Uh, he, today, he's going to talk to us about the process of owning your own education. What's involved in that? Uh, how do you build a bear uh, in the educational frame? Uh, and many of you know he's written a new book called Major Decisions. I could go on and on and on about Henry because I love him, but uh, I'm not going to. I'm just going to turn the time over to him and ask you to welcome Henry Irie. I'm very grateful to be here with you today. Um, I, I can't believe you're here. It's, it's going to be 80 degrees this afternoon. Are the golf courses closed? What's, why are you here? I, I don't understand. Um, but I'm grateful, and I hope that uh, we'll be blessed to have experience together today that will be useful to you. Already just feeling the great spirit of this place has been a blessing to me. Um, uh, of course, I can pay tribute to your dean, uh, just as he did to, to me. Uh, it would, were it not for him, I would not have made the connection with Kim Clark uh, that has taken me to BYU-Idaho and changed my life. It is, uh, it is not too facetious to say uh, President Clark and I met on the Internet. Uh, it was only because... Uh, <laughs> I didn't know him, but uh, Doug had uh, prepared the way for me to send uh, a message. This may be of, uh, of some interest and maybe even some help to you. Um, I'd never had a conversation with Kim Clark about what he was going to do at BYU-Idaho. And I'll just give you a, a little bit of background. This is in, in the, the spirit of the, the value of mentors in your life. Um, so here's a fellow I didn't know. I couldn't believe it. I still remember getting the news that the dean of the Harvard Business School, who'd served there 10 years and had been viewed as really effective uh, there, that he was going to go to this place, BYU-Idaho, which I had last encountered as Rick's College. I don't know if you remember those days. Rick's College was this little place that... Uh, I first saw as an eight-year-old. My father had been a professor at Stanford, 
And uh, he was given the, the invitation to go preside over Rick's College. It was literally the end of his academic career. Um, and uh, so I'd seen this kind of thing happen. But my father was, uh, he was a just tenured 38-year-old professor at Stanford when he was invited to go to Rick's College. Um, that was not nearly such a stretch as inviting the dean of the Harvard Business School to go to BYU-Idaho. Um, but uh, the President Clark said yes and went and had been there um, for, actually had not yet arrived at the time that uh, Dean Anderson and I had a conversation at his instigation about my working with Kim Clark. And uh, I was skeptical. Not of his talents, but I was worried. I was worried that the dean of the Harvard Business School would go to this new university, this new four-year university, which had no graduate programs and was doing no scholarship. And I thought, I'll bet he's going to, to try to make it over into Harvard's image, or at least Williams College, or something you know, more akin to what he'd experienced. He had done, he was a Harvard undergraduate, a Harvard graduate student. He'd been at Harvard for coming up on 40 years, I think. And I was really skeptical, and I did not want to be part of what I thought might happen. I thought, if he's going to try to turn this into a real university, I don't want to be there. I had experienced that. Uh, I'd watched... I'd watched schools climbing what they call the Carnegie Ladder, uh, where for the sake of prestige and, uh, and frankly, for the sake of faculty interests in, in scholarship, you, you, you move up and you start to pay much more attention um, to your, your personal scholarship and to the graduate students who can help you with that scholarship than you do the students and especially the undergraduate students. And so those students get left behind. And I didn't want to do that. And so I, uh, I, I'd learned enough to, to know that if you're, going to, if, you, if you're going to have a disagreement with the partner, you want to have it really early on, ideally before the partnership is formed. So I wrote a memo. I never met the, the fellow, never had a chance to the, to test my assumption about what he might do with the university. But I wrote a six or seven page memo saying, here's what I think you should do. And here's what I think you should not do. So I just figured, you know, if this is going to be a pipe cleaner up his nose, I want it. I want to put it up there right now. <laughs> we'll never have to talk again. He'll just, you know, he'll think I was really forward. But, but we just won't, you know, I'm not going to go to Rexburg, Idaho and get trapped uh, in part of it, implementing a strategy I don't believe in. And, uh, and I ran it by Doug, and he encouraged me to, to send the memo. And, uh, and interestingly enough, it turns out President Clark and I were on the same page. And once I knew that, again, I hadn't anticipated talking about this, but this is significant for you in your career. Once I knew that, I didn't care about anything else. In fact, we, we had uh, several weeks' worth of discussions uh, where we just, you know, we got to know one another a little bit. And then he gave me a phone call, first time I ever heard, heard, heard his voice over the phone. And we just, we just agreed that I was going to go to work for him. I still had a fair amount of that mission to conclude. We never discussed position, title, or salary. I just didn't care because I knew I had, I had friends who, who, uh, who knew Kim Clark well, including brothers, who said, if you can do this, you must do it. This could be an unbelievable mentor. And, uh, and I knew that we agreed on the strategy for the university, and I didn't care about anything else. Um, and uh, I don't recall when I learned my salary. I will tell you, uh, and I don't know whether... <clears throat> you'll be impressed by this or not, it was a five-figure salary. It was the first five-figure salary I'd had since graduating from 
the MBA program at BYU um, 15 years before. But that didn't matter. By the way, it hasn't gone up a lot. Um, <laughs> I, I, I've, I've been blessed largely through um, the, the, the goodness of the folks at SkyWest Airlines. I became a director there. And uh, their stock did very, very well. And when, when I exercised those stock options that had been given to me, I paid off the house. And it was why I was able to serve the mission. And it was why when Kim Clark and I had that discussion. By the way, he wasn't authorized to offer me anything. In the LDS church, you've got to go through these approval processes, which uh, among the steps in that process, uh, w w there was my father. Um, and so you know, we sort of we kept that on the QT for a, a long time. And, uh, and he literally, we, we never had a job description. I, I'm, I'm advancement vice president. I, I don't even today know what that means. Um, but certainly as you think about the early jobs that you'll take as you complete your education, you'll do so well to view, view it as postgraduate work. And so well to think of it in terms of mentors. Who will, so Dean Anderson talked about the value of a place like Utah State University. The value of a Utah State University over, say, a on, purely online <coughs> university is that there are professors here who, if you play your cards right, um, can become lifelong mentors to you. And then if you're wise, what you'll do is you'll go out and your first job, maybe your second job, you can. All the jobs thereafter, you will choose people instead of positions. You, you may even choose people over companies. So I'll, I'll give you, again, I'll go back to this story of Roger Martin. Um, Roger Martin was the third of the three interviewers I met who hired me at Monitor Company. And uh, I like the other two fellows all right. They were a little younger, and they were more skeptical of me and my BYU MBA. They'd never hired a BYU MBA, and, and in those days, Monitor was very much a Harvard. It was very, very small. They, they were affiliated with, with Mike Porter, who was hot, hot, hot at the business school there, and almost everybody they hired was from Harvard. But Roger Martin didn't care that I was from BYU. And, and we, we made a connection. And I could just tell, this is the guy. I'd been with another, at another firm, fancier than Monitor Company. By the way, Monitor has since passed through a kind of, I mean, they were in technical, they were in technical bankruptcy um, as a result of the recent downturn. They'd grown very aggressively overseas. Um, I have a little piece of equity in the firm. I just got a K-1 that showed that that has all gone to zero this year. Um, but that doesn't matter. Uh, it doesn't matter that the firm that I visited earlier in the, in the morning has gone on to great success, was more prestigious at the time, and uh, has not gone bankrupt. Um, and, uh, but but, but I, I knew I wanted to be around guys like Roger Martin, and he was, the, he was the one partner of the firm with whom I met, and I thought, I'll bet the other partners are like this guy. And that proved to be the case. And I had a marvelous education. I wasn't there for a long time, but as uh, Dean Anderson pointed out, I got the experience through Roger. I went in one day and I said, I'm quitting. Uh, I didn't say it in exactly those terms, but uh, I'd worked for the firm for just shy of three years. And uh, I got an assignment to lead a project for a firm called I guess I better be careful. Anyway, it was one of the larger computer companies in the world at that time, and it was going down. Okay, they made a kind of computer that was was being tremendously undercut by high-powered workstations and personal computers. Okay, and they had lost in the quarter that that we got hired to help them with their strategy. They lost a billion dollars that quarter, and that was back when a billion dollars was a lot of money. Um, and so they were just, they were in desperation mode, and, uh, and I was leading a team, and I just didn't know the computer industry 
well, I got to know it on that case, but I was, I was no specialist. And you could see quickly that the problems they had actually didn't have to do with computers. It had to do with a disruptive technology and their having been overbuilt, classic Clayton Christensen style stuff where um, everything they did was designed to serve this super premium high-end user. And that was really all they knew how to do. And even if, and they had some, we discovered it had some great technology. If you could have pulled that technology out of this multi-billion dollar firm with their salespeople, non-commissioned salespeople, they were so confident of their ability to sell this iron. They had salespeople making two and three hundred thousand dollars a year flat rate. Um, and if you could have pulled the technology out of that, you could have created, and that was part of the founder's problem. It was a brilliant, brilliant guy who founded the company. And he could see the technology. And he says, we're going to be OK, because we've got that technology. And he'd even pulled things like that off before, where the company looked like it was on the brink, and, and the and engineers saved it. But they'd gotten so big that it wasn't enough to have the killer chip. They really did have the killer chip, reduced instruction set computing. And even I, as a non-technical guy, even I could see the power of it, but I could also see that the organization was going to collapse under its own weight. And it did. And it was acquired by a company which has since been acquired. And uh, anyway, that's the world of, of Clayton Christensen and disruptive innovation. But, uh, all I knew was that it meant that during this period, so I was meeting with the senior management team every Tuesday and every Thursday of every single week, as though we were going to fix the company in real time. And the fellow who had sold the project had gone. He had a, he had a, a, uh, a standing tradition. Every spring, he would do three weeks of sailboarding in the Caribbean. And this was his three weeks. And I was left holding that bag. And uh, my wife had a baby. And 10 days after the baby uh, uh, was born, on a Mother's Day, I was in the office trying to get rid of, ready for one of these Tuesday meetings. And that was it. I was just not going to do that anymore. And I went in to, later that week, I went in to see Roger Martin. And I said, Roger, I just don't think this is working out. Um, the lifestyle is killing me. It's not what I really like doing. Um, and I think I'm probably going to be leaving the firm. Now, by the way, it was a terrible mistake on my part to have drawn that conclusion and then shared it with him right up front. Fortunately, it was Roger Martin. And Roger Martin is not only a very level head and a person who liked me, but he is, he, he is a master of inquiry and helping people figure out, uh, not just listening to what people say, but helping them, trying to figure out what they really mean, better yet, what they really want. It's a tremendous skill. And, and Roger practiced it on me. For, the first thing he said was, Henry Eyring, of all people, you're the last person I would have expected to come in and say this. And part of that was that I'd, I did love the firm, but part of it also was that I'd kept my head down and I'd never complained until I made the mistake of, I got to the breaking point and I went into Roger and I said, Roger, I, I'm just, I'm done here. Anybody else with any ego or anybody who didn't love me as much as Roger did would have said, okay, fine. Because people quit in those high-powered, high-pressure environments all the time. And there's always somebody new to replace them. And uh, he could have let me go. But we started talking. And, and he said, uh, you know, what kinds of things are you thinking about doing? I said, well, I'm thinking I might go back and get a PhD. I love teaching. I like writing. And so I'm thinking maybe I'll, I'll go back and, and get the Harvard degree. I've always wanted. And Roger very thoughtfully said, you know, the founder of our firm, whom I had not, I'd met once, but didn't, didn't know well at all, he said, is, is looking to do some writing. And he connected the two of us. And that put an extension on my career, not just an extension on my career at Monitor, 
but really changed the whole path of, of my career. Um, so for, for what it's worth, as you think about that first job, if you can, there are certain things that are maybe top of mind, and if you can, you want to try to suppress them a bit. Um, one of them is prestige. So I'm very, very glad that I, I chose the much less prestigious of the two firms that made me an offer. Um, and uh, the other was money. I wasn't particularly concerned about what I was going to get paid. Now, it, it, it did pay well. But what I, what I discovered was that the feeling I had about Roger, and that I extrapolated to others in that interview, that was the thing to go with. Uh, and that really, I was just, it was just a continuation of school. And if you're lucky, your career will always be a continuation of your schooling that you'll always be doing new stuff, working with new ideas, going places people haven't gone before, and doing with people you really like doing it with. And if you get into that sweet spot, the money will come along. It really will. And if you try to optimize on the money, the odds that you will have that kind of experience are very, very low. And, and one of the great mistakes is to, is to say, well, I'm, I'll compartmentalize this. I'll sequence it. I will go out and make enough money that then I'll have the flexibility to do what I really want to do. Uh, there are two problems with that. Um, one of them is that it often doesn't work even on the front piece. Making money is difficult. I have a dear friend, uh, Doug knows him, who's a billionaire and, uh, and a, a fellow SkyWest board member, and I Every quarter, I'm on his jet, and I'm reminded of who I'm not. I, I look around at this, and by the way, it, it fits him. You know, some people, for some people, Gulfstream is, is a statement. In this guy's case, it really fits him, so it's just right for him. But what I realize is, um, this isn't me. And, uh, and part of the reason I know it isn't me, because he said, this is his phrase. I'm not going to say it here because it involves a curse word, and I will avoid that. But he says, getting rich is difficult. You fill in the blank. <laughs> getting rich is difficult. If it weren't, everyone would do it. That's what he says. And it's just sort of his warning to those of us who think, boy, I'd love to have enough money that then I could do what I really want. Okay, So the first problem with that is it doesn't often work. It's very, very rare that you can get rich. And it's especially rare that you can get rich if you're doing it just for the money. If you get the chance to meet rich people, what you're going to find out is it's, it's not about the money. I mean, money may be a way of kind of keeping score. But they love the game. And it happens to produce a lot of money. and uh, and. and so it happens for some people, but very rarely for folks like me anyway, for whom money is sort of what I, I want to satisfy my monetary needs, and then I'll go do what I want to do. The other problem with that is that uh, once you, even if you got the money, what you find out is that finding a passion and connecting your personal passion with a career is pretty hard to do, especially if you kind of start, start out on it later in life. You know, where you, if you've been to sort of, I'm going to be the, the tire-biting dog that just chases every car I can. I'll, I'll get up the corporate ladder. Uh, if that's been your mindset, you, you're probably going to get to the point, if you're lucky enough to have this pile of money, where you will not have the skills or even the attitude to really figure out, what is it I want to do? Now, that brings us back to where we are today, because my counsel to you is, Start working on that problem now. What is it I want to do? Um, you need a career dream. By the way, it can be wrong. That's OK. Because if you've got a career dream and you pursue it, you're going to find out if you don't like it. Then you'll be able to switch. And you'll probably have get, gained some insight along the way that says, boy, you know, this particular career 
has got these qualities. I actually don't like these qualities. I'm not a numbers person, or I'm not a people person. And that will allow you on the next guess to guess better, okay? The, the really expensive path is no guess at all, okay? So now we're talking about your major, for instance, as well. Same thing with a, a, a career as a major. You'll often find folks who, who will say, especially at the fancier colleges, they'll say, oh, 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 don't pick a major too quickly. You need to explore your interests, take all your general education. By the way, I, do we have undergraduates here today? Or am I talking just, oh, OK, great, great, great. OK, I thought we were more graduate students. Um, so you, you, you know, uh, I, if, you're, if you're LDS, for instance, it's fairly common to say, well, I, I'll, I'll go on my mission, and then I'll come back and choose my major. Probably the only thing you're going to learn on your mission about your major is you don't like door-to-door -door sales. <laughs> right? Uh, you, you know, so, you, that, so if you find yourself thinking there's some, there's some point at which it will dawn on me what my major should be, uh, I'd, I'd, I'd caution you on that and say, you know, a better path is to pretend you know. Just pretend. Make your best guess. Um, the advice that my father got, so this is another story. By the way, I, did, I was going to be very interactive today. And I promise we're going to get interactive, but I keep thinking of stories to tell you. Um, my father was one of three sons of a very famous chemist at the University of Utah. And this chemist, my grandfather, uh, had, had this deal. You can live at my house while you go to college, and I will pay for your tuition. You can major in anything you want as long as it's physics. <laughs> okay? So he had three sons who majored in physics. And my father was probably the third best of them at physics. One was very successful, went on and became a chemist, and is, is still at the University of Utah. Um, but my father was not at the time. He, he just didn't have his heart in physics. And, and that realization came to him one day. What, what happened was, he, uh, in, in, as a senior in high school, he was a pretty good basketball player. But he didn't get his full height and weight until he was a freshman in college. And, uh, and he really came into his own a little too late to play collegiate basketball. But he made up for it with a very heavy intramural schedule. Okay? <laughs> and, uh, and, and the intramural games were played 7 o'clock, the pickup games. You got, and if you don't get there at 7 o'clock for the pickup game, you know what happens. You, you sit there waiting until, until there's a slot, if a slot ever does open up. Anyway, so his idea of, of getting uh, homework done was, it's got to be done by 7. And he would, uh, he, he would try to work all the problems he could, but when, when it got down to the wire, and he didn't have some of his homework done, and, and, and we were approaching 7 o'clock, he would go to his father, the math genius. Uh, Grandpa was a chemist, but he was, he was a theoretical chemist, a really good mathematician. And so my father would go to his father and say, hey, I just need help on a couple of these problems. He was careful never to ask about anything he didn't need help with. Because what he knew Grandpa would do is Grandpa would say, wonderful. Let's go down to the basement. And down in the basement is an unfinished basement where they had nothing but a blackboard. That was his idea of a game room, Grandpa's. <laughs> and, uh, and Grandpa would say, and, and, and my father would say, no, I, I, don't need, I don't want to go downstairs, please, not, not down to the dungeon. Uh, and, and I said, I just, I just need you to, sh I can't figure out how this formula works. This is a new formula. If you just should tell me how the formula works, I'll be fine. And Grandpa would say, oh, let's derive the formula from first principles. <laughs> so a good mathematician and a good physicist knows that the most specific and complex of equations rests upon the very, very basic ones, you know? force equals mass times acceleration, that kind of stuff. And Grandpa's feeling was you never wanted to be reliant on a textbook. 
you wanted to, you didn't, or somebody's formula. Because if, other way, if, if all you know is the formula, you're the slave to the formula. By the way, this is a moment where I'm going to announce that actually relates to the subject I plan to speak about today. <laughs> okay? So we'll come back to that, that you don't want to be the slave to the formula. Okay? One of the, re one of the reasons that's true is because if all you know is the formula, guess what? The computer knows the formula, too. So think about that. It goes back to this question of why does a, a, a pilot not make more money when the pilot's got the passenger's life in his hands, but the executive can make 10 times more? We'll come back to that. Okay. Anyway, so grandpa would say, Hal, you don't want to be dependent on, on the formula. Let's derive this from first principles. If you can derive from the most basic uh, equations wh whatever it is you, you need, you'll, you'll not only never need a textbook, you'll be able to go beyond the textbooks. And that, I think that made some sense to my father, but the pickup game started at 7 o'clock. <laughs> and he didn't want to take the time to do that. And on one of these occasions, uh, when they're downstairs in the basement, Grandpa sticks back and says, Hal, we worked a problem like this just last week, and you don't seem to have made much progress on it. Have you been working these problems? And, and my father said, no, I have been working these problems. And, and again, it was a deeply reflective moment for my, my grandfather, a guy like Roger Martin, who looked at his son and said, Hal, don't you think about this all the time? <laughs> and, and my father said, no, I don't think about this except when I have to. And, and, and Grandpa just couldn't figure that out. He said, well, you mean you don't just naturally, like when you're in the shower, you don't think about this? And my father said, no. And Grandpa knew that the key to success is to find the thing you think about when you don't have to think and turn that into your career, the thing you think about in the shower. And so he said, Hal, I think you better get out of physics and find something you really love. Now that is really, really powerful advice. It's not easy, by the way. It took him a long time to do that. He stumbled into the Harvard Business School. Uh, literally, it was just, it was, a, it was an Air Force colonel who said, Iring, you ought to go to the Harvard Business School. I'll write you the letter of recommendation that's going to get you there. Notwithstanding a B average coming out of the University of Utah and no prior business experience. No leadership experience, really. Um, but, uh, but then he found the thing there in business school and by the way, it had to do with organizations and people. And especially, it turned out, universities, colleges. And he found that he thought about those things when he didn't have to think about them. Um, I'm, I feel blessed this morning at 6 o'clock. Uh, I woke up a little before the alarm, and I couldn't go back to sleep, and I didn't want to. Um, this is, again, this is a little kind of personal autobiographical. Um, I'm having, I'm, I just feel as though uh, I walked into Yankee Stadium by mistake and somebody put pinstripes on me. Um, I'm, I'm co-authoring a book with a guy named Clayton Christensen at the Harvard Business School. And of all things, it compares the evolution of two schools, Harvard University, and BYU-Idaho, and, and uses the lens of disruptive innovation. And, uh, uh, and Clayton and I had a conversation yesterday. We're just about to the end, but he, he could see something missing. Came up with a brilliant framework for framing the whole book. He explained it to me in 15 minutes. I've been working on this manuscript for two years. I thought, why didn't I think of that? And at 6 o'clock this morning, I just, in fact, I went last night, I had to turn my brain off. 
because I wanted to think about that. And I said, I, I need sleep. I turned that off. Six o'clock, it came back on again. And that's, that's what I think Grandpa was talking about, you know, shower time. And uh, hard to find those things, but you'll, the good news is you'll know, when, you'll know when you don't have it. I did some, I got a law degree. Dean Anderson mentioned I got a law degree. Uh, mostly just because I felt the need to differentiate myself. I didn't get into the Harvard Business School when I was 21 like I wanted to. I was a geology major who had studied nothing but geology. Oil was selling for $8 a barrel. So I couldn't get a job in geology, and the Harvard Business School said, you need full-time work experience. I felt stuck. I went to BYU, did an MBA, did the law degree to differentiate myself a little bit, um, did one legal internship, and boy, I'll tell you, I figured out in a big hurry I was not a lawyer. Um, so you'll know it when you, when you see what it's not. The only bad major is undeclared, okay? Um, the, the only really expensive decision is no decision. When you're choosing a major, when you're exploring a career, you got to explore. And the way you do it is you get into character. You declare the major. And you get in there and you act like you love it. If it's political science, you don't just study your political science homework. You get a subscription to foreign affairs, and you act like you're going to be in the CIA or you know, you're going to be a senator. And you put that on for size. And if it doesn't fit, you'll have learned something very important. And you'll walk away from, those, from that study with perspectives that will be valuable to you. Geology has been valuable to me. Law has been valuable to me in a funny sort of way. Law is valuable to me because I actually know how much lawyers don't know. Okay, what I know is, with the exception of some narrow fields where they specialize, a good lawyer has to do just what a law student has to do, and that is figure out what the issue is and to go do some research on it. So now when I sit around a, a, a boardroom table and, or you know, if I get subpoenaed or if I have to give a deposition, I'm not as scared as I would be otherwise because I know that the lawyers have a way of thinking that I understand a little bit, but there's not some mystery that I could never understand. Um, that's valuable to me. It's valuable to think about, to have the, a view of jurisprudence and to, and to know how lucky we are to have laws. What separates us from uh, Russia or in India is not natural resources. It's not the natural industry of our people. It's the rule of law. It's the idea that a contract is binding. Now, there's an economist, Francis Fukuyama, who calls this the economics of trust. We, we have the benefit of trust, and we have that thanks to the laws of this land. Now, three years of law school was a pretty high price to pay to get that, um, to that insight. Um, but my point is to say that even the wrong choice that you'll make uh, won't cost you as much as you think, and it's probably going to teach you more than you think. And if you're thoughtful about it, you don't want to jump into something willy-nilly. Um, you want to make the best choice you possibly can, research it, and then keep your, keep your antennae up. If you're not going to like it, you'll find that out pretty quickly, and then you want to boldly say, well, this major is going to be my minor. I'm out of here. And even if it's not your minor, that's okay. Um, what you want to do is you want to be out there sensing and experiencing, and along the way, you'll discover what you love. And when that happens, there will be enough money in it to make you happy. Now, I'm going to stop here. We are really going to go back, and, and we're going to talk a little bit about that airline pilot and, and the executive, because that does influence, should influence your, your, uh, your career and your decisions and your, the way you build your major, your, your college education. But I'm, I want to welcome now questions or comments based upon what I've said. If you're a lawyer, throw something at me. I'm, I'm sorry. Any thoughts about that? Have, you, have, have your parents ever given you advice, something like that? Um, yeah, 
that my dad has always told me, it doesn't matter what I do as long as I become an inventorist. Because uh, he's built a practice and he's got like a satellite office just waiting for me. Oh, so I don't want to be able to be in somebody's face for the rest of my life. So oh, I mean, okay. I agree. That's why I'm just sitting here at the end of this year. Super. Good for you. And you know what? Your father's going to understand that. He does now. He does, yeah. Yeah. Let me just talk quickly about, oh, yeah, there's another hand. Yes, back there. Um, I've always kind of proposed to the idea that you can learn to like whatever you want. So I picked a major that I thought I could uh, get a job in easily and that I would be comfortable in, in that respect. And uh, tried to learn to like that since then. It wasn't necessarily something that uh, I thought of when I didn't want to think back then, but I trained myself to do that. Yeah. Uh, what's your opinion on that? Well, I think, that, that, look, all jobs are difficult. So part of what you've been told is true, and that is part of liking something is deciding to and really getting into it, getting your heart into it. I talked about how excited I am right now with this manuscript I'm working on. It's fascinating. If I put that down for two weeks and it goes cold, I don't want to go back to it. So there's something to be said for the attitude of, of being in it, of getting into it. On the other hand, and this is a good segue into this uh, the little bit of discussion we'll have of why people make the money they make. So back to this question of, uh, you know, can, can you like any career uh, you choose? There's a dimension of every career that requires you to just decide, I like it. And that attitude, if, by the way, that's not lying to yourself. That's getting your head in a position where you can enjoy what there is to be had. You've got confidence. You're thinking about it when you don't have to. Let's go. Uh, this, this comes out of this little book that I've, I've written. Uh, it was an idea that came to me when I was weeding one morning, and I was, I was thinking about, you know, as students, you come to the university trusting, and you ought to be trusting. Um, the, the faculty at a great place like, like this one really care about you. They probably are here for you. They're not here for the money. Some are here for scholarship, but you're going to find that a whole lot of them are here for you. So uh, you should be trusting, but there's a challenge, and that is, uh, only you can figure out where you're headed. And in fact, many of your faculty members will have come themselves. Their passion was academics. And so they may not have experienced the type of world in which, which you'd like to head. Um, then on top of that, it's, it's funny. I, I mean, I've kind of been out in, in the world of education and business for a long, long time. And it just occurred to me one morning while I was, was weeding I don't know why some people make more than other people make. And the differentials can be pretty pronounced. Um, this, a, a pilot for a regional airline, even after spending hundreds and hundreds, maybe over 1,000 hours in the air training, can you guess what a regional airline will pay a brand new pilot? 35,000. 35,000? Anybody else? You actually, I'll have a guess. yeah, you. That's the number, twenty-two thousand. Okay. Do you know how many? Uh, do you know what that is on an on an hourly basis? Okay. Now it's not. Now it's. I'm not talking about the hourly for for the pilot. It's decent on an hourly basis, but you don't get that many hours. If you could find a two thousand dollar, excuse me, two thousand hour a year job. Okay, 15 bucks an hour would get you 30,000. All right, so think about that. Think about the amount of time the pilot has spent training. And in fact, what it turns out is, uh, you, you can't see it here, I've got a baggage handler there and a, and a flight attendant there. Turns out the pilot's compensation and the flight attendant's compensation are not that different. Now, the pilot with seniority thanks to the union, is going to make more toward the end of the career. But it's much closer than I ever would have thought. Okay. Now, contrast that with the executive. 
How much is the, how much is the ex, a, a, a senior executive, one of the named officers, you know, one of the top four or five people in an airline, how much do you think they can make a year? Millions. Um, now, why? How do you explain that? The pilot has the passenger's lives in his hands, literally. Has spent tremendous, takes more time to, to get your pilot's license than it does to get an MBA. That's not true if you count the undergraduate degree, but many pilots are going to have the undergraduate degree. So what, how, do you, how do you make sense of that? It's important to know. Yes? It's a fair point, okay? It's a, it's a good point, but uh, uh, how much does it cost to have someone die on your plane? Do you know what it costs an airline when a plane goes down? You can just imagine the lawyers lining up, right, around that. And especially if there's some suggestion of, you know, they weren't trained properly, they weren't doing their jobs well, that can cost you tens of millions of dollars. So there are, money's part of the answer, but there's, there's in addi addition, something else. He has to be innovative. The management, he has to make new ideas, or he has to make calls that the pilot doesn't. He just has to get on the plane, fly to the place, drop off the people. It turns out, that's a big part of it. It gets back to this idea of the formula. Turns out that flying is pretty formulaic. Okay? Even when things go wrong, there are pretty standard procedures how you react. And you can practice those procedures. Actually, you don't these days even have to be in a real aircraft. Okay? You can practice that by computer. It's quite formulaic. On top of that, the computer actually that runs the flight simulator, it knows how to fly the plane too pretty well. So what you're finding is, in the, in the old days, you used to have three people in the cockpit, okay? A pilot, a co-pilot, and a navigator. Now how many is it? Two. Two. Have you heard talk about they're going to one pilot? It turns out that the computer is doing a fair amount of the flying in a, in a large aircraft already. And so you find yourself saying, you know, I want I definitely want a backup. I want the pilot there in case the computer gets it wrong. And I want someone there to back up the pilot in case the pilot dies. But the guy who runs Ryanair is talking about one pilot and maybe a flight attendant who's trained to be the pilot's backup. Interesting, OK? So what's happening? And, and, and anyway, this is the idea for what I don't know what it's worth. Uh, I don't get royalties on the book, so uh, I, 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 not worth any money to me. I hope it's worth something to you. Uh, what, what we've got is I've, I've created this matrix. And, and what we ha have down here is, is a kind of job where the procedure is pretty standardized, OK? The baggage handler and the pilot are both doing things where there's a pretty standard procedure. This is what you do. If you follow the rules, you're, you're by and large going to be all right. And even when things go wrong, the, the procedure to be followed in that case of that emergency is pretty standardized. All right. Contrast that. And by the way, the pilot makes more than the baggage handler because a lost bag <coughs> is much less expensive than a lost life. So there's a premium represented in that, uh, but not nearly so great as the premium made by the executive. And interestingly, the, the flight attendant's pay is not that far off of the pilot's. His or her job is different um, because it requires more judgment. And you can see that easily with the executive. What do you do when the union strikes? What do you do when the price of oil triples and you weren't 
you, you didn't have your fuel hedged. There is no standard procedure for that. If you get it right, it's worth a whole lot to the company. If you get it wrong, it can cost millions of dollars or billions of dollars. The company can go out of business. Flight attendant is actually the same way. What do you do when a passenger gets unruly and starts to threaten you and fellow passengers? I mean, there's some procedures for that, but that's going to take thinking on your feet, literally. It's lower stakes and therefore a little lower pay. I mean, it's a, you know, those things don't come up very often, and usually you've got fellow passengers to help you deal with the problem. Same thing, flight attendants do get safety training, how to get people off the plane if it crashes. Henry, I'd just like to point out that this, is, uh, this idea uh, is very similar to Roger Martin's idea of uh, the innovation funnel moving mystery, heuristic, and heuristic Interesting. to analog. Interesting. And uh, Roger made the point on, on Monday that reason why companies like GM get in trouble is they have moved so far down that curve uh, toward analog and then the, the ultimate uh, next step is code that you can essentially commoditize uh, the business. And when it gets from analog to code, then you can let the folks in India and China do it. So right on. And, uh, and so this, this principle is a principle that is something that I hope you all take away from this discussion this week. Is to look for stuff to do that uh, others can't do. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, if you if you are so fortunate enough to have started a business on the basis of moving from mystery to, to heuristic or heuristic to analog, take the gains associated with that and go solve another mystery. Yeah, you want to be in the mystery business. That's where the, the money is. Now, by the way, money's not everything, but it's something. And so as you look at a career, don't take for granted that it will be the same 10 years from now as it is today, or it was when your parents thought it was a good thing to be doing. If you're down here in this arena where the decisions matter quite a lot, they're high stakes, so you got to get them right, but they're procedural, we can come up with machines to do that. Even very expensive machines are less expensive than people. Healthcare costs for machines don't increase all the time. Okay? Benefit plans don't tank for the machine. You don't have to go in and put a whole bunch more money into that contractual agreement you have to pay benefits for the person. So it's, it's, it's really remarkable if you go to an automotive facility have you ever been to, to an a auto assembly plant where they're welding cars together? Anybody seen that? It's really amazing stuff. Imagine Jurassic Park with machines. Okay, these pterodactyls just coming down and whoo, sparks literally flying, giant robots. Must be terribly expensive. But 15 seconds after they've started, that car is done. Completely done. No wage, no health care to worry about, no defects, it's done. So it turns out that for stuff like this, it's worth spending a lot of money on a machine. If it can be computerized, it will be computerized. That's what's happening, unfortunately, to the pilots. Okay? It's actually happening less to the baggage handlers because baggage handling equipment is pretty expensive, and these folks are still really cheap. The, the frightening thing is, this is, the, this is the box where you're more at risk. If you're pretty well paid and what you do can be computerized, look out. You're gonna, actually going to be okay. What, what we're showing here is um, your competitor down here is probably someone who's uneducated, may or may not be living in this country, uh, could be overseas, could be an immigrant who's work, willing to work for very, very little, that's your competition. You're actually pretty safe there um, because you're not going to be undercut a whole lot, but your wage will be limited to what those folks are being paid. The computer comes in and you may be just, there may, the job could literally go away. 
then if it's a matter, as, as Dean Anderson said, if it's a matter of it involves a judgment call, but it's pretty low stakes, we're, they're probably going to outsource that and send it overseas. Okay? So when you need someone to troubleshoot your computer, that requires some judgment, but if they get it wrong, it's not the end of the world. Okay, that's going to go to a call center in the Philippines. Um, someone who's got about the same amount of education you does, do and is willing to work for less. So I, I call the, the realm you want to be in the realm of high-stakes judgments, the realm of solving mysteries. And it would strongly encourage you to think about that as you look at a career. Don't look at it through the rearview mirror of where it's been, what people have made in the past doing that. Um, look at it especially from the standpoint of whether it involves high stakes judgments and mysteries. Be careful if it looks like the kind of thing that a computer could pick up or that could be outsourced efficiently to someone overseas who's about as smart and educated as you are but willing to work for a whole lot less. Now we're to the point where I think an angry mob is gathering outside the door. Is, is there any, any question that, that I might address in conclusion? Yeah. Um, just with your respect to your time with SkyWest Airlines, they've been a very, very good company, very profitable company over the years. I've heard it from Jerry Atkins' side, but from, from your point of view as a director, what are some key things that they have done that have helped them to be so successful? You know, frankly, a lot of it goes back to Jerry, if you know him. This is a guy who, who lives up in that right-hand quadrant. He really, really knows the business. Interestingly, I think one of the things he does, he does two things extraordinarily well. You wouldn't think they're that valuable. Uh, one is he gets to know people, and people get to know him. The other is he doesn't make rash judgments. When, when the airline goes, oh boy, the stock does this, and Jerry's just steady. His emotions never get the better of him. And uh, the combination of fundamentally knowing the business, loving the people, keeping your cool, that's been worth a lot to SkyWest and its employees. Henry, thanks so much. Please join me in thanking Henry Irons. <laughs> <Yeah. clears throat>